Hello and welcome and thank you for joining the Oceanside Beach Sand Replenishment and Retention Device Public Information Session and thank you for your interest in this project. I am Stacy Mueller from GHD and I will be hosting today's event. Simona Ramirez Diaz will join me also from GHD and she will assist in the production and moderation of today's event. As we are all likely adapting to new technology, I'd like to cover some of the items to expect while viewing or listening to our event today. We're hopeful that you'll be patient with us also as we work diligently to bring this event to you. First, today's event is being recorded and it will be made available for future viewing through links on the city's webpage. Secondly, you have joined us in listen only mode through the WebEx Event Center platform. There will be a period during today's event when those of you who have joined us by the internet will be able to ask your questions and share your comments through a Q&A feature and a raise hand feature on your screen. We will share instructions on how to submit those questions just before our question and answer sessions begin. Please note that questions and comments you submit today may be published for all attendees to view during today's event and they may be made public in future reports. If you have dialed in to the audio conference only, you will not be able to submit questions today through the Q&A feature. You will remain in listen only mode, but we will share additional ways tonight on how you may ask questions and share your comments after tonight's event. I'd like to share tonight's agenda. You'll be hearing from Kyle Koger, the Public Works Director for the City of Oceanside. You'll also be hearing from Brian Leslie with GHD. He has a technical presentation for us. And we'll pause to answer some of your clarifying technical questions in the middle of Brian's presentation. Then we'll open up a moderated Q&A along with public comments and also a polling opportunity to gather your feedback, hopefully near the end of this first hour. And finally, we will hear from Kyle Koger once again to summarize what's next in the process for investigating the solutions that are presented tonight for the potential needs for sand retention and beach nourishment. Finally, we're going to encourage you to keep these commitments in mind as participants today. Whether you've joined us as an attendee, a presenter, or a panelist, let's keep the meeting purpose in mind, and Kyle will share this with us in just a moment. We also want to recognize the diversity of perspectives, and we'll also recognize that there will be future opportunities for dialogue. So this is very early days for these projects. And at this time, I'd like to introduce Kyle Koger of the City of Oceanside. Kyle, you may begin. Thank you, Stacy. Well, welcome everyone, and thank you for participating in the public workshop tonight. Oceanside has a long history of beach erosion, and the city has initiated this process to identify feasible solutions to protect the beach from long-term erosion by either utilizing renourishment projects of beach-suitable sands or construction of retention devices to retain reduce the loss of sand or a combination of both. The goal of this study is to identify strategies that are environmentally sensitive, financially feasible, and that have a reasonable chance of being approved through the regulatory permitting process. It's important that we don't negatively impact our coastline or other coastal communities, and we really want to be a good neighbor. We see this process as one that could be used by other communities to solve similar issues. We understand that this will be a long process, and this is just the beginning. We have held and will be holding several more virtual meetings with the community, stakeholders, and resource agencies. Uh, some of those uh, folks that we'll be meeting with are the California Coastal Commission, Regional Water Quality Control Board, Corps of Engineers, Surfrider Foundation, Sandag Shoreline Preservation Work Group, the San Diego Climate Collaborative Sea Level Rise Work Group, other coastal cities, uh, the public which we're meeting with tonight, and other interested parties. Our consultant, GHD, has begun the review and analysis of data and relevant global projects and has developed six concepts that they will be presenting tonight as a starting point. The ideas presented tonight are conceptual, and we welcome your input on these concepts or others not covered. Thanks again for your participation today, and now I'll turn it over to Brian Les Leslie, who is the project manager with GHD. Thanks, Kyle, and good evening, everybody. I'm going to share a slide deck with everybody and walk through 
our different sand retention and beach nourishment options. So as Kyle mentioned, I'm the project manager on the consulting side. I'm with GHD, but we're joined with the Scripps Institution of Oceanography and also um, Pi Environmental. Scripps Institution of Oceanography are, are leading the um, establishment of a baseline condition of the beaches, kind of like scientific baseline, and then also a, a robust scientific monitoring program that's gonna go with anything that we do. So our pilot's gonna be grounded in science. High Environmental and Brent Martian specifically is going to be leading um, or helping us find quality sand sources and also identify and um, score our alternatives against these nearshore reef impacts. He has a good sense. And we've worked together to map the offshore reefs within the, the city of Oceanside. So it's going to help understand the marine biological impacts of these various alternatives. So as Kyle mentioned, we're in early days of this study. Um, it can, our scope of work can be simply thought of it in these four different categories. We've done some data gathering and understanding of the existing system, and we've developed some conceptual alternatives. We want to put those alternatives out to the public and stakeholders to receive some preliminary feedback before we refine those alternatives, and then um, subsequently put them through numerical modeling um, kind of run numerical models on them to understand different impacts um, that they might have, positive and negative. Concurrent with our schedule, Scripps Institution of Oceanography will be developing a scientific baseline that we'll be using for any of our options. Our schedule is about a year, and we hope to conclude in the spring of 2021. As Kyle mentioned, the problem in the city of Oceanside is one of chronic beach erosion. This, is, this graphic shows the city of Oceanside beach widths and shore zone volume, another metric to identify or track changes, which basically takes into account all of the volume within the shore profile, and how those two things have been tracking over the last 20 years. And you kind of see it all sliding down and to the right. Um, so that's despite sediment management activities that the city and the core are actively doing within the city. The city's participated in two regional programs, uh, regional beach sand programs, that have put over 600,000 cubic yards of sand on their beaches. And then the core puts about 200,000 cubic yards of sand on the beach, you know, despite all these, um, that's per year. And uh, again, despite all these efforts, the beach widths are decreasing over time. Kind of a visual of that problem is, is shown in these two pictures. You have your summer condition, and this is, is maybe not um, typical of every summer, but you have narrow beach with south of Oceanside Pier. And that puts a strain on recreation, but also the, the local economy. And though the economic impact is tough to quantify, it's, it's well understood that a thriving beach brings positive benefits to a, a coastal community. So we wanna be mindful of those things. And then you, in the winter condition, you have, um, flooding and coastal infrastructure impacts as high water levels and waves impact, um, come further landward and approach these structures and approach this infrastructure. So that's another thing, um, another bad thing to not having a beach. Kyle mentioned the goals of our program is to develop this environmentally sensitive, financially feasible and program that has a reasonable chance of being approved. Our Approach objectives are, are simply to develop a, pro a pilot project, start small and build over time as success is, is achieved, and ground our project within a scientific uh, basis with, through the scientific monitoring program led by Scripps. And then our project is within the design phase, we're thinking of a project that can be adaptable and reversible over time. So, um, Based on the science that we're receiving, we can we can add, subtract um, to our project and reverse it if impacts are too great. Uh, worst case scenario. All our project concepts are being scored against these following um, evaluation criteria, and these are just the, the list we came up with so far. We want to hear from you and and see if um, hear if we missed anything. But we'll be putting all alter alternatives through these various criteria. Top of the list for 
um, for us is performance and downdrift erosion and surfing impacts, but there's good on the list. These are the things we're thinking about. Again, let us know if you think we missed something. As far as project concepts, we have three beach nourishment concepts, concepts we're looking at and three sand retention concepts. But I wanted to mention that those aren't intended to be standalone concepts. We intend them to come together to, to form our preferred concept. So the, the highest scoring one of each, um, each of these bins will come together to um, form our preferred concept. But now I'm gonna get into our sand retention options. We have three that we're looking at again, for sand retention. Three are a multi-purpose artificial reef, a groin system, and a jetty extension. Our first option, the multi-purpose artificial reef is a drawing inspiration from Queensland, Australia, and the Palm Beach Artificial Surfing Reef. This reef has just been deployed um, about a year ago, and it's kind of the state of the art in artificial reef design. It's drawn upon all the other projects that have been built around the world and taking lessons learned from those, and putting together what they believe will achieve a retained beach and a surfing resource for the community. Thus far, the surfing resource piece of the project, piece of the puzzle has been successful in that it's a, it's a surfing amenity to the community. So it's being viewed very favorably. However, it's only been in, in the water for a year, so we don't really know too much about how well it's doing to retain a beach. So TBD on that. Um, here's some features on the right about this project. Um, it involves a pre-fill of nourishment, uh, quite a bit of five to 10 ton rock, cost about 12.5 million. And again, it's just been deployed. So what we did is we took that concept and we made it applicable to the city of Oceanside. Um, in Southern California, we have much longer wave periods than the Queensland coast. So we had to modify the design to make it work here. And the way we did that was to basically take a detached breakwater type concept, similar to like the Venice, Venice Beach um, breakwater. And, and basically have Palm Beach surfing reefs on either end. So you have an emerging crest breakwater that's gonna have reflective wave energy against it, but then you have on the edges submerged areas where waves can shoal and break and hopefully be a surfing resource. The end product hopefully would be a, a salient that would build up behind or in the lee of the structure um, because the wave energy would be reduced and kind of creating this calm effect where sand can, can fall out. The concept as it stands is about a thousand feet long. And some considerations that we're thinking about is we need to a sand prefill and also some bypassing um, needed every year. So make sure that um, downdrift impacts are minimized. Um, surfing improvements are not a guarantee, even though this is kind of the state of the art, we can't guarantee that we're gonna create this resource. It's um, just not something we can do. Um, the other thing to think about is nearshore currents are likely. So around the edges of the structure, you'd have likely some, some localized rips that could be mitigated through public safety type of um, additions to the project. Our second option is uh, a pretty semi-traditional approach, groins, well proven as a system to retain sand in beaches where longshore transport is dominant. We're looking at, I mean, there's so many examples of groins around the world and throughout the nation, but um, we're looking at those as well as some local examples like in Newport Beach and Carlsbad and Imperial Beach. How these structures are retaining or holding sand in place is what we're looking at to help um, build out our design, lengths of structures and widths between them, things like that. So what we propose in this example layout is a two groin system that are four to 600 feet in length and about 1500 feet apart. And we start with, again, with a starting small, a two groin system, and if those are successful, we can, we can build over time. Similar to the artificial reef, we have a pre-fill a pre and a bypass need that we'd have to think through. Um, surfing impacts, positive or negative, are difficult to predict. So there's plenty of empirical evidence of surfing in and around groins being a good thing or improved condition. The localized beach widths are going to vary seasonally, so you're going to have this fillet growing on one side uh, of the um, one side of the groin field in one season, and that might shift to the other side during the other season. Uh, 
winter to summer type of reversal. And similar to the artificial reef, we're having these localized rip currents that will have to think about. Our third option is an extension of the south jetty, and it's a 300 foot extension of that groin. And the idea here is to capture sand moving in a longshore direction to the north. And what we've learned through talking to the Corps is that the, the south end of the entrance channel is the first to fill. And it seems like there's a lot of sand that's that's coming in from these harbor beaches. So if we can capture sand before it gets into this complex, we can pick it up through another means through a, a bypassing program. So this in that way, this this option is very much um, not standalone and that we need to think through a, a bypassing program as well. Another thing to think through is that the federal government owns this groin, so we need to coordinate closely with the core. It doesn't accrete sand where we need it most. It's putting it um, you know, in an area of need, but not maybe where we need it most. So we'd have to truck haul that sand down or dredge it and, and place it south, further south in the city. Surfing impacts, again, are, are difficult to predict, and we know this is a surfing resource to the community. So that would be something we need to be uh, mindful of. At this point, I want to pause and take any clarifying questions on those three options being considered. I want to mention that beach nourishment options, the three of those are up next. So we'll try to um, kind of shelf those questions till after we present those three options. Excellent. Excellent. Brian, I'll let you know that there's probably some feedback. <laughs> Very good. I'm going to uh, switch screens very quickly and let people know that we have opened a Q&A feature. So we're going to share with you uh, how best to use that. Um, so as Brian mentioned, we are going to take questions at this time for the sand retention options. Uh, so if you have any questions or you would like uh, Brian to respond or get some clarification on any of the three options that he shared, and we'll we'll toggle back and forth between this slide and those three options, uh, please limit your questions at this time to the sand retention questions. Uh, take a moment to find the Q&A feature. It's likely on the bottom of your screen. Um, you may see a question mark icon, or you may need to find an icon if you're on a mobile device that has three dots. This is the more options icon, and you can select Q&A. These icons, again, may be on the bottom of your screen, or if you're on a mobile device, um, they could be in the center or the right side of your screen. Um, you can type in questions and then you can select all panelists and finally select send. And we will acknowledge receipt of your questions with a general response. And we will also um, publish those questions so that other attendees may view them during this live event. Um, we're also going to ask that you use appropriate language and we'll be monitoring the messages uh, as well as giving warnings for those that don't comply with that request. Um, and repeat use of inappropriate language will be cause for removal from today's event. So just a reminder, if you've joined late or if you've dialed in um, into the audio conference only, you will not be able to submit questions tonight and you'll remain in the listen only mode, but we'll share later in the, um, the event tonight how you can ask your questions and provide comment. So I do see some questions um, coming in, and the first question comes from Kimberly. And Kimberly, thank you for your question this evening. Um, Brian, do we have locations in mind for the sand retention options and for the groins and the reef? Yeah, thank you for that question. Uh, we do have some ideas of location, but we really want to hear back. We really want to hear from you. Uh, we have a polling that we'll be conducting after the presentation that, that speaks to the lo location type of question. Um, so we're focusing south of the pier, uh, I'll say, and we're looking at um, the fundamentals of, of coastal engineering to kind of dictate the kind of the spacing, the length of, of these structures or just the kind of different, um, I guess, design considerations, but we're, there is some flexibility in exactly where that goes and where we deploy first within the pilot. So um, we have some thoughts, but we'd like to hear from you. 
Thanks, Brian. Our next question uh, comes to us from Bill, and Bill would like to know, uh, is the idea with the SR3 option that the jetty extension would capture sand and then manual efforts would be used to spread the captured sand down to the beaches in need to the south? Yep. Yep, that's right, Bill. Uh, it would capture, basically make a, a larger fillet against that groin, and then sand could be picked up in that location and trucked or dredged down to areas in need, like further south in the city. So you got it. Thanks. David asks, have you considered sea level rise in these options you presented? Yep, uh, that's a good question. We are considering sea level rise in our evaluation criteria. It is there's a tricky one, and Russ is on the, the line as well, and he can help um, me answer this. But um, yes is the answer. Basically, having a beach definitely adds some coastal storm damage protection to the city's coastline. And there's some literature that, that suggests that beach nourishment can keep pace with modest levels of sea level rise like one to two feet. Um, so given that, I mean, we're looking at kind of designing around like a mid-century or, or, or later program, depending on how sea level rise uh, projections are pan out. Uh, Russ, do you have anything uh, to, to add to that question or to that response? Brian, I don't think I could articulate it better than you have, but I just would emphasize that it's important that um, that all stakeholders have um, proper expectations uh, regarding um, what sand retention and beach, beach nourishment can accomplish over time. We have sea level rise projections, long-term sea level rise projections that if realized um, would likely uh, make some of these options um, uh, somewhat um, not useful um, in that there could be a point at which um, there is no beach on which to place sand. We're going to move on to discussion of uh, beach nourishment. Uh, so it is important to be mindful of the projections to understand that at a certain point, again, if those projections are realized in the future, uh, we would likely be looking at other alternatives beyond those that are um, the topic of discussion this evening. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, Russ. Our next question comes from Rick. Rick asks, what are the proposed locations of the two groins in retention option two? And I think, uh, Brian, you might have mentioned that later on in the uh, presentation and the polling session that we may present those uh, exact locations. Yeah. Very good. So, Rick, if you'll be patient with us, we'll uh, we'll get some responses uh, on the options for locations. It looks like we'll be considering more than one. Uh, the next question comes from Andrew. Since Oceanside beaches face primarily southwest, is this a consideration of the alignment of the jetties? Yeah, we're certainly taking that into account. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it plays into the longshore transport regime as well as the orientation. You know, groins typically are, are placed just shore perpendicular and that's kind of where we're gonna start. And uh, as we run through models, the numerical modeling exercise will understand whether adjustments or refinements to that design need to take place. Thank you. <laughs> Chris asks, one retention option had an associated cost, but the other two did not have an estimated cost. Is there any estimate on the other two options? Brian, are you or the city prepared to discuss cost? I'm going to defer to Kyle on that. Kyle, do you, I have some ballpark numbers I can, can share. I mean, they're not, they're very rough at this time, so I'm not sure whether we want to get into uh, that at this point. Yeah, Brian, you can give us some rough costs. I, I put some very rough costs together based on uh, proposed projects from years ago. So yeah, we, we know it's it's rough and has to be refined. Yeah, okay. 
Yeah, so as far as the two groin project and, and assuming a pretty of the longest that we're talking about, which is 600 feet in length, and uh, we're, we're looking at going shorter, um, there'd be a, about um, 20 million to construct. And the, uh, we don't have a number for the South Jetty extension at this time. I need to, uh, it would be less, I, I would think it'd be less than that. It would be my, be my guess. Um, the multi-purpose artificial reef concept, the, the number that I shared for that was from the Queensland project and is not a, a perfect number to apply because that's um, our concept. We modified that to have that detached breakwater piece. So um, it's somewhere in the neighborhood of like a $20 million option as well, $25 million option. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, Kyle, for uh, responding to those cost questions. Uh, we have seen a few more cost questions come in, so uh, I know that uh, your responses are helpful uh, as people ask their clarifying questions. Um, I do want to move on uh, away from cost for just a moment. Um, John asks, how do these involve the annual dredging of the harbor entrance? It's happening now, and it may be adding diesel or air pollution to already hazardous air. Okay. So that's maybe a, a two-part question, with a, the first part being to do with how are we thinking about that sand management activity and then um, the environmental impact. So I'll hit the first, first part first, in that um, we are definitely looking at that program and how we can best utilize that sand to, to feed into our project um, and trying to uh, make it easy for the core to, to maybe move sand further south within the city to areas in most need. Um, as far as the environmental impacts of that program, I, I can't really speak to that. That's um, outside the scope of our study, sorry. Very good, and I'll pause for just a moment to um, catch up on these questions. Uh, the next question comes from Mark. Does the course of action for those three solutions, uh, does the course of action address sand retention south of Wisconsin Avenue? It seems as if it would only have an impact on the area immediately adjacent to the South Jetty. Sorry, so this was SR3? I, I believe it, um, yes, Action 3, SR3, does it address sand retention south of Wisconsin Avenue? Uh, well, yeah, and no, it wouldn't address retention south of Wisconsin. It would, it would capture sand within a location within the city that then could be managed by the city to then bring down to locations like Wisconsin, but wouldn't, um, you know, by itself wouldn't retain, wouldn't bring a structure down there to retain sand. Very good. The next question comes from Bob, and this is also directed to you, Brian. Um, regarding the proposed solutions, do their designs take into account any goal of sand retention as far as cubic yards? That's a good question. We haven't gotten there yet, Bob. We are, that's the next step. So we've just roughed out some preliminary ideas, these concepts, and um, we want to hear back um, from everybody, make sure we didn't miss anything or um, stark objection to an, an option, things like that. And, and, and once we get past this phase, then we'll get into kind of more detailed engineering design and running it through the modeling exercise. Very good. The next question comes to us uh, from Megan, who is also curious about cubic yards. Um, Megan asks, can you please discuss the general sediment transport within the region, longshore direction, the rate, cubic yards per year, and do you expect each of these sand retention structures to adequately trap the amount of sediment needed to maintain the beaches? So there's a lot packed into that question. Um, yeah, do you want to take that? Let me try to unpack and, and Stacy, let me know if I missed something. Sure. Um, as far as the longshore sediment transport, there there is quite a lot of literature on on how sediment moves within the city. Though I'll say it's 
it's quite dated. Um, well, it's not, you know, it's just, it's, it's, it's on the older side, I'll say that. So um, the general understanding through all literature is that the net sediment transport is to the south at a rate of about 200,000 cubic yards per year. So that is the rough um, number that, um, you know, everyone seems to land on whether, you know, there's a range, of course, so some studies saying 150 and some saying 300. And then um, just anecdotally and just kind of knowing the area, there's, there's shifts depending on how much wave energy we get from the southwest versus how active our winter was. I mean, there's going to be some years where we're clearly going to have more, you know, in one way than the other. So these are kind of averaging exercises and doesn't represent, you know, one year perfectly, per se. What I missed in there, Stacey, can you help me out? Um, sure. The second part, I'm getting a little bit of feedback, sorry. Do you, expect, do you expect each of these sand retention structures to adequately trap the amount of sediment needed to maintain the beaches? Yeah, so, sorry, is there feedback in my line, Stacey? Just at the uh, transition when, when I start speaking, but I think we're, we're cleared up now, go ahead. Okay, I could go to my mic if I need to. Okay. Let me know. You're fine. Okay, so um, yeah, we're thinking with within these net, these understanding the literature and the science of, of sediment transport, we are are sorry. Let me get my thoughts together. I mean, we know we need to make basically this 200,000 cubic yards per year go past our our groins or whatever we do in, in the retention side, so that everybody down drift gets what they they usually get so to speak and um, we need to then so there's like the common sand retention are as pre-fill that's what, what is referred to as pre-fill and then bypassing so you put a structure out and then you pre-fill the beach or you nourish the beach right in the vicinity of your structure and then you put enough on the down drift side so that you and um, that you're going to minimize this impact to, to down drift beaches so we haven't come up with exact volumes yet, but these are the two things that we'll be um, designing into this program. Thank you, Brian. Megan, hopefully we uh, we responded to all of the, the pieces of your question, but please let us know uh, using that Q&A feature if there was something that um, Brian may have missed. Um, Brian, I know you're in the middle of your presentation, but I'd like to um, try to get three more questions in and then let you resume, and then I'll try to pick back up in the order that these questions have come in uh, during the, the longer moderated session. Um, so our next question comes to us from Carolyn, and Carolyn says you used Venice as an example, and Venice does not have any quality waves. Um, by extending the South Jetty, have you considered the effects it would have on this? I believe it is the um, the quality wave. Yeah. Okay. So the Venice example was brought into SR1, um, which was the artificial reef. Um, basically, what we're doing with, with um, use Venice as an example as a detached breakwater that we're adding to the edges. We're basically putting the Palm Beach surfing reefs on either end to make a submerged or to make basically an area where surfing would be improved, hopefully. So, yeah, you'd have right in front of the structure like Venice would be. Um, be a surf spot but on the edges could be surfable similar I, I also flashed a picture of of sand spit where you have a similar situation or snapper rocks we have reflective waves off the front but you have shoaling happening on the sides and, and a surfable corners essentially and then the other option other thought was or the other question was to sr3 and um wave impacts to that option right stacy something like that quality surf impacts to SR3? I think that, I'm sorry about that feedback. Um, yeah, so the the question uh, that has come in is asking by extending the South Jetty, have you considered the effects it would have on the, on the quality of waves? Yeah, um, that's a good question. We haven't done that yet, except for just, um, we haven't got into a detailed thought on that, but we um, we acknowledge that's a, a real concern and that's a, a certain resource for the city that's um, so we, we'd be looking at that closely. 
Thanks, Brian. Um, again, uh, we do want you to continue with your presentation. I'm going to go through two more questions. Dirk asks, are you considering shorter groins with closer spacing to create more beach areas? Uh, we are considering about four to 600 foot long groins, and that's not a, um, so that's a, that's a big range, and that's not a firm number at the moment. But we're thinking, um, you know, all this depends on the amount of amount of sediment and the amount of quality sediment we can get. So what we really need is coarse grained sediment, and it's something that's semi lacking within the city of Oceanside right now. Um, the difference between the dry beach and the offshore beach is quite stark, and the amount of um, uh, fines within the material or just the degradation difference. So. Um, we are looking at some shorter groins, but um, we are we are not. Um, so it's, it's something. I guess the answer is yes. We're looking at shorter groins, but we're going to run these through the model and see what they come up with. Currently, based on empirical kind of examples around us in Southern California, I'm looking at Newport, I'm looking at Imperial Beach, the like 400 seems like a good minimum to use um, based on what we're seeing the, the performance of these groins. Um, yeah. Very good. And one last question your way. Yeah. And the question goes, uh, the question comes to us from Michael and Michael asks, how far south would these solutions be placed? Do you want to respond to that? Yeah, yeah, sure. So again, we haven't selected locations yet though uh, we would we assume that we'd roll all the way down to like Buena Vista Lagoon as as kind of the southern end. We've even you know thrown out the idea of like a terminal groin down by Buena Vista Lagoon and, and coupling our project with that project since they have a lot of export. I shouldn't say coupling our project with their project, but just thinking about their project in light of our project so that we can take advantage of Sediment that's going to come out of that lagoon as part of that restoration effort, and then maybe even like the long-term kind of maintenance um, of, of sediment that comes out of the inlet. Um, so yeah, all the way to the south end of the city is what we're looking at. Excellent. Um, there were some follow-up questions, a, a, a three-part question there. So he was curious if um, those solutions would extend all the way to the border uh, for Carlsbad and if there would be any coordination with Carlsbad. Do you want to comment on that as well? Sure. And yeah, it ties into my, my last response. So we're looking all the way to the south end of the city. And, and yes, we've already started coordination with the city of Carlsbad through a regional group called the San Diego Climate Collaborative. And we we are gonna resume more outreach and discussions with them. We're also going to be presenting to the Shoreline Preservation Working Group, which is attended by um, members of the staff who work on shoreline issues, but also the city council members that from each coastal city that sit on the board. Um, so yes, we're we're planning to talk to the city of Carlsbad for sure. Very good. So Brian. I'm going to let you resume your presentation and I'm going to give the presenter privileges back to you. So if you'll give me just a moment to do that, you can resume on the beach nourishment option. Great. Great. Thanks, Stacy. Um, yeah, moving on to our three beach nourishment options, we're looking at a fixed bypass system, a mobile bypass system and uh, kind of a long-term traditional nourishment program. Those are the three uh, nourishment options we'll be talking about. The first option is this fixed trestle bypass and it draws inspiration from you know, back to uh, Queensland and New South Wales and Australia. And the system that's been in place for over 20 years is the Tweed River. This system um, through this fixed trestle or what looks like a pier on the updrift side of the Tweed River captures about 650,000 cubic yards of sand per year, then delivers it through a number of underground pipelines to a number of receiving beaches on the downdrift side. The city has, um, or the council, has established a stakeholder group made up of surfers that help 
um, steer or kind of direct, hopefully direct what they advise on where they, they think the sand should be placed to mitigate surfing impacts. Something like that could be mirrored in the city of Oceanside. The capital construction costs 20 years ago, granted, were 20, uh, $36 million. And this program had it as an average annual cost of 5.2 million. An example layout of what the system would look like in the city of Oceanside, and this is a really crude mock-up, but there would be the fixed trestle intake somewhere on the Camp Pendleton side to pick up sand moving from north to south. And that system would deliver sand via a number of underground pipelines to multiple outlet locations within the city of Oceanside where, where we need it, um, where there's chronic needs for sand. Things to consider with this option are sand transport to uh, both the north and south during these different seasons. And also a system that was in place in the city of Oceanside in the, the 80s and decommissioned in the 90s. So this basically a pilot sand bypassing system was in place that picked up sand from within the harbor at two locations. These are the pump intakes shown in the red arrows or red X's. And the system ultimately failed. There was a problem with the fluidizers and kelp getting stuck in the system. And then also just funding, like a long-term committed funding source wasn't available to the project. And things got rusty and, and needed a lot of upkeep. Uh, another thing to consider with this option is sand mining from Camp Pendleton. So that's, um, you know, we're starting the dialogue with Camp Pendleton, but that's that's a big kind of if whether we can have this infrastructure on on Pendleton and also whether we can, you know, draw sand from. The other system is a, a kind of a scaled down mobile version of a bypass system, and it's it's, it's common to a number of councils within Australia, but um, the one that we're drawing the most inspiration from was is from Noosa in the Sunshine Coast. The system is small and it's portable. Um, after you do a little bit of um, infrastructure, put a little infrastructure in place, you can just run this thing um, every year and produce about 80,000 cubic yards of sand. So what happens in Noosa, the sand moves all in one direction, moves down and, and clogs this entrance channel. So what they do is they pick up the sand at this location with a red X every year. And they draw the sand back up to the top of this little uh, literal cell, if you will. And they protect the, the coastal infrastructure in, in most need by doing that. Um, to me, the beauty of the system is that the city could then take management, um, active management role in the, in the coastal resources or in the coastal sediment supply within the city and redistribute as needed. Some potential pickup locations or intake locations for the mobile system would be at the South Jetty, at the North Jetty, on the Camp Pendleton fillet, and maybe even if there is a, a terminal groin constructed at one of us will give you, and there could be like maybe a, a pickup location at that, that spot. Some considerations are the, the production rate is not huge at 80,000 cubic yards per year, so it need to be coupled with something else. Safety issues around the intake locations. This is an issue, but something that the councils in Australia have been really easily able to work around. People are really comfortable with the systems now and um, safety issues are really minimized. Uh, we need to think through the kind of the kelp getting stuck within the intakes. That was a problem with the, the fixed system that Oceanside piloted. And the benefit of the system is just kind of a, a lower entry point at um, you know, three to four million and, and being able to potentially operate it with city staff. The third option is kind of a, a long-term semi-traditional nourishment program, thinking through the financing, the renourishment intervals, the volumes, and also finding really high quality sand sources that the city can tap into on these, on these fixed intervals. We'd be looking at traditional sources of sand, like these offshore sites that were used for regional beach sand one and two, but also look at things like the San Luis Rey River mouth that has high quality sand, um, Camp Pendleton that, that fill it along um, the jetty there. Offshore bar, again, I talked about offshore borrow sites and also like Buena Vista Lagoon, looking at that. Um, what we view this, view this being is like one-off dredging episodes that would happen at these fixed intervals using traditional methods. 
some considerations with this option is the volume of quality sand available both initially and then in the long term. The ownership of these different sand sources, going back to like the Camp Pendleton example, whether we can tap into that um, source consistently. Um, the environmental impacts of a long-term program, these are going to be lots of, lots of actions happening over time, so we need to think through that. And um, these are, are, are fairly expensive um, dredging campaigns uh, as they uh, roll out. So the next steps is back to kind of our, our milestones. The next steps are to, to refine these concepts and to model them through a numerical modeling exercise. And concurrent with our activities, again, are the, the scientific baseline that Scripps is doing. And we anticipate rolling out to a, a 20, spring 2021 council meeting to present our findings of our draft study. And at this point, I'll open up the discussion on beach nourishment concepts or anything else that, um, that people have questions on. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And at this time, we are going to uh, go ahead and pause for just a moment. We're going to pull up uh, a slide for the moderated Q&A. So we still have the Q&A feature open. You're welcome to continue uh, to ask questions. And if you give me just a moment, bear with us. And I'll uh, give presenter privileges back to Simona, who is helping me this evening. We appreciate that pause uh, while we make that transition. So thank you all for your patience. Um, we want to make sure that we acknowledge receipt of all your questions and uh, your comments tonight, we will be um, giving you a general response and we'll publish the questions so that other attendees may view them during this event. Um, again, we're gonna ask that you use appropriate language. We'll be monitoring those messages uh, and we will be giving warnings uh, for those who do not comply with our requests. So um, repeat use of inappropriate language will be cause for removal. Uh, as a reminder, and for those who have joined late, if you've dialed into the audio conference only, you will um, not be able to submit questions today through these features, but you'll remain in listen only mode. And we hope that you, uh, you stay on in case uh, someone else has a similar question uh, that you do, um, but we will share some information on how you can um, contact the city with uh, questions beyond this evening. Um, so before we begin our question and answer session, I'm going to take a moment to introduce our panel and I'll ask our panel, uh, those of you responding to questions tonight, to go ahead and uh, share your webcam at this time and uh, be prepared to come off of mute. Um, so responding to questions today um, from the City of Oceanside, Kyle Koger is on the line, the Public Works Director. We also have Russ Cunningham, um, who also jumped in. Uh, thanks, Russ. Uh, he's a principal planner for the city of Oceanside. And Jonathan Borrego, the deputy city manager. So we do have um, a full house here from the city of Oceanside. And um, Brian Leslie, the project manager from GHD, will also be staying on the line. Um, so we want to take a moment before we begin um, to uh, let you know how you can ask questions. Um, so we'll throw those slides back up on uh, how to ask a question. Uh, we'll begin the question and answer session. Again, the Q&A feature is open, um, but we're also going to be using a raised hand feature. So I'm gonna open that uh, feature as well. I'm gonna tell you how you can use both. So give me just a moment to do so. If you would like to type your questions and comments to us, then you'll want to use that Q&A feature that we've had open. But if you would rather speak in your own voice this evening and share your comments or ask your questions, you'll want to use the raised hand feature. And we uh, will allow you to join a speaker queue and we'll call on you to speak. Um, during this period, we will be toggling back and forth between um, some slides that will instruct you 
on uh, how to participate as well as those six solutions that Brian discussed. And we're going to alternate um, responding to groups of questions. We'll take a few from the Q&A feature and then we'll alternate and take a few from the um, raise hand feature so that we hear from as many of you as possible this evening. Um, so we'll take some pauses. I see that um, it's just before 7 p.m. So we're doing pretty well on time. Um, Simona will give instructions on how to use both the Q&A feature and the raise hand feature to speak. So Simona, are you ready? Yes, thank you, Stacey. We have included instructions on the screen for how to participate using the WebEx Q&A feature. Uh, take a moment to find that Q&A feature by hovering your mouse or tapping at the bottom of the screen. You may see a question mark icon or you may need to find the icon with the three dots. This is the more options icon and then select Q&A. Uh, these icons may be located on the right side or, or at the bottom of your screen. Type your question, then select all panelists, and finally select send. Um, as you said, we are also using the raising a hand feature to speak. Um, for that one, please take a moment um, to find that feature by looking at the more options icon at the bottom of your screen or the participant icon at the right top corner um, as shown below. Uh, please check your audio settings. Look for the more options icon at the bottom of your screen and select use computer for audio or use internet for audio. Um, if called upon, you will have two minutes to state your name, organization, and ask your question or share your comment. Uh, we do ask after speaking, you select lower hand. Um, and throughout this session, I will toggle between uh, both instructions. Uh, instruction slide, sorry. Um, and at this time, Stacey, I believe we uh, stopped the Q&A at 6.25 if you wanna go back um, at that time. Thanks, Simona. So I will take a few of those questions um, that did come in through the Q&A feature first. Uh, and I'll remind folks that um, if you're joining us that you may have questions about those beach nourishment options that Brian mentioned. So feel free to pop those in along with the, uh, the sand retention solutions that he mentioned. Um, at this point, uh, all the questions. Uh, would be appropriate that you have to uh, to pop into the Q&A feature or to raise your hand to speak. So I do see some hands raised and we'll get to those in a moment, but I'm going to revisit um, beginning with Charlotte's question. Um, and Charlotte has a location specific question. She lives um, in the 1400 block of South Pacific Street and has significant splash onto her patio in the winter months. Will the retention options that have been mentioned apply in this area of the beach? Sorry, Stacy, the location one more time. It's this... the 1400 block of South Pacific Street. And if Russ wants oh, to give a cross okay. street, if that's helpful. Uh, that's That's okay, I think we're just, South Ocean side um, in general. I'll just say that um, you know it depends where we where we site our pilot project and and how much we can accomplish with that. And I think that there will be you know we can't protect the whole beach with the pilot project. We need to again start small and and grow with success. So um, depending on on where that's sited, um, but having a beach fronting your your property would would help in these types of wave run up events. So this is what's happening. You're getting these, these long, large, long period wave events and, and waves are approaching your structure um, for Batman and running up and probably, um, yeah, um, causing some of that splash. So it depends where we site the pilot ultimately, but I, I think in the end, no matter where we site the pilot, the whole city is gonna benefit eventually. We just need to kind of all kind of go at it together and know that we have to start somewhere and we can grow over time as we see success. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Charlotte. So we could uh, get through the final uh, points in the presentation to revisit your question. The next question comes to us from Taryn. Brian, I'm going to direct this to you, Brian. Uh, regarding the artificial reef, what material are we considering to use to build it? Yeah, so we're considering rock. Rock is the, the most consistent kind of proven material to use. Uh, we looked at the use of geotextile bags, both um, for groins or artificial reefs. And there's been some really 
good examples of, of their use for groins, but the, there's most examples where they've been used for artificial reefs have gone poorly. And we just don't think um, with the wave environment, with the water depths in the city of Oceanside that that, that geotextiles really makes sense. Um, the Palm Beach Surfing Reef also used rock and looked at alternate materials and landed on rock. So it's just a, a really, it's a proven material. It um, can promote nearshore habitats. Um, so I would just, we're looking at a really large rock. Thank you. So the next question comes to us from Casey. And Casey asks, how far would the groins extend out? Right, so there's been a couple questions on this so far. We're, we're looking at, this isn't firm and we're giving a big range, but right now we're looking at like four to 600 foot long groins. And that's based on these empirical examples locally, looking at Newport and looking at Imperial Beach and Carlsbad and, and kind of the blocking distance that they provide uh, or capping of sand that they provide. So those are, that's kind of the range we're looking at right now is four to 600. And that I should clarify that is from the, the most landward line. So basically the revetment line or the rock line along the city's beach. Thank you. And the next, next question comes to us from Dave. Dave asks, where would you plan to locate the prototypes for um, and I, he's he said SR1 and um, I think the other option, he's he's repeated SR1, uh, so you might want to revisit that uh, you haven't cited any locations for those sand retention options, uh, but may want to summarize. Yeah, um, and we have that polling question that's coming up. What's that next, Stacey, right? Um, yeah, we're going to try to get to that. I think um, we have a lot of questions coming in, so I want to make sure that we respond yeah. to a lot of those questions. But we certainly don't want to uh, to to lose our audience. We want to be respectful of their time as well. Um, I'm still seeing a good amount of participation here with 79 folks on the line, so we appreciate your time and your interest tonight. Um, so maybe we should table Dave's question and we can uh, review it in the in the polling options. Would that be best? I think so. We, <clears throat> we haven't, <clears throat> excuse me, we haven't landed on an option or the, the siting of these locations yet, or siting of these structures. We're looking south of the pier and we have some ideas, um, but we, we want to put that out to the, the audience and what you think might be appropriate. And, <clears throat> and you'll see that poll come out in a second. Okay, very good. And I did see a question, uh, a repeat question, uh, but similar question um, from DM who asks about the materials that are being considered for the artificial reef. I believe you responded that the uh, material would be rock. Um, so we appreciate uh, your your question and your follow up comment there, DM. Um, and then finally, um, before we move on to the phone lines, we'll take Serena's question. Um, so Serena is curious if there's been success getting groins or artificial reefs through the Coastal Commission with other projects. Yeah, so um, there has been, but there's not a lot. There is, um, so the, <clears throat> on the artificial reef side of things, there was one in Dockweiler called the, um, or El Segundo, called Pratt's Reef. And that was the last artificial reef that was constructed in California, and that was made of geotextile bags. Another data point to why not look to geotextile bags for, for this structure. Um, I don't actually know. I, I think that in the, combined with that, there's a couple groins that were constructed or a groin that was constructed in front of the Chevron at El Segundo. And I think um, I think that might have been the last permitted groin um, in California and that was in the, in the 80s. And um, so, yeah, there's not a lot to draw on. We understand this is something that has been looked uh, upon um, negatively by the Coast Commission, but in conversations with them, I think um, they're more open to this idea, especially amidst um, cities trying to be resilient to sea level rise and some of the challenges that they're facing with sediment supply. You know, this, as Kyle mentioned, the city of Oceanside is not the only city that has um, problems with with beaches right now. So I think a lot of people are 
are thinking along the same lines as how can we better manage sediment? How can we retain sediment to draw to buy us some time? So in the spirit of that, I think Coastal Commission is kind of opened the door to these types of solutions. Stacey, I would add that in the uh, context of our draft coastal hazards adaptation plan, which uh, we have shared with Coastal Commission, uh, preliminarily we have received a less than favorable response from the Coastal Commission to the prospect of these forms of sand retention. But as Brian has said, a, a regional dialogue um, has um, begun uh, and is gaining some momentum. Um, and I think to the extent that the region um, is able to speak with one voice um, in discussions with the state about um, adaptation measures that um, work in our context, in, in the context of, say, North County, which has its unique features, or even more specifically in Oceanside, we are obviously, as you can see from the photo here, um, we are uniquely impacted by the Camp Pendleton boat basin. The impacts of that boat basin diminish um, down coast. So being the jurisdiction most impacted by that particular impediment to uh, down coast sand transport, I think there's an argument that our unique conditions, our unique challenges may call for unique strategies. And I think that that argument is is certainly gaining some traction in in the region if not at the state level russ thank you and uh brian thank you uh for responding to uh that question that's come in through the q a feature um simona i'm going to ask at this time if you'll toggle back to the um how to use the raised hand feature i do see one hand raised so i'd like to go to um to the phone line and let people ask their question or provide their comment in their own voice if this is something that you'd like to do rather than uh, type your questions or your comments to us just look for that raised hand icon uh, it may also be the more options icon those three dots at the bottom of your screen um, and depending on what mobile device you're using it could be on the participant icon that might be in the top right hand corner of your screen uh, but you want to make sure that your audio settings are such that you're using the computer or the audio for internet, so you might give them a test. Um, and when you're called upon again, you're going to have two minutes to state your name, organization, and ask your question or comment. So I do see one raised hand. Um, Emily, Emily Springfield, we are going to um, go ahead and set our speaker timer, and um, you will have two minutes to state your name, organization, and ask your question or provide your comments. So Emily, I'm gonna unmute your line now and you can address us. Hello, um, I was wondering um, if you guys have considered negative effects on wildlife, um, especially the snowy plover and the grunions that are endemic um, and what measurements are being taken to support this wildlife. Thank you, Emily, for your question. Um, if you're finished, I will mute your line. Very good. And um, Brian, do you want to respond to Emily's question on the wildlife? Sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, we are considering environmental impacts as part of our, our um, kind of the ranking of our different options. So we'll be looking at wildlife habitat, the least turn and, and grunion impacts uh, to, to state a few within the environmental impact kind of criteria. So yeah, all of our six options, we're gonna kind of run through the this decision matrix funnel. And uh, of course, one of the, one of our uh, really important criteria is environmental impact. So we'll be looking at all those things. Thank you, Brian. And thank you, Emily, for, uh, for speaking to us this evening and asking your question. Um, I'm I think we answered your question. If we have, I'm gonna ask you to return to that uh, raise hand icon and tap it one more time, and that should lower your hand. Uh, but you're welcome to uh, keep it raised if you have other questions, Emily. So, um, yeah, hi. I was just wondering at what stage you guys, like when will we hear about that? What stage are you considering? Like I know this is the very beginning stages, but obviously it needs to yeah. be considered throughout the process. So 
uh, when will you, yeah, when do you expect that to happen? Can I just jump right in, Stacey, or so wait to you? I'll, I'll jump right in. So I, I think, so we're at the super start of this project, um, developing concepts, and then again, our next step is to, to kind of refine them, to model them, and to kind of weight or rank them um, through this multi-criteria decision matrix. The next step would be to, to do like the full-blown environmental impact um, review, or environmental review, which could be a MND or EIR um, permitting for the project, and then the final engineering design. So that would be the next step. Uh, but once that would happen, once we kind of reach concurrence around a preferred option. So hopefully by you know spring 2021, we have a preferred option that we can move forward into that next step. Yeah, I would just I would just add that the project would be subject to review under the California Environmental Quality Act, and we would be obliged, we would be required to address your question as part of that process. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. And um, again, if you are finished, we'll ask you to, uh, to lower your hand. Um, and Simona will toggle back to the how to use Q&A feature uh, in case the, uh, the attendees that are joining tonight are more comfortable um, typing their questions or their comments to us. Um, I would like to return back to, I'm not seeing anyone else with their hand raised at this time, so I'm going to take a few moments to um, go back to the Q&A feature. And again, we appreciate everybody's patience. Um, I'm going to ask just a couple more questions, and then I'd like to start the polling session. Um, and I, I know it's getting a little bit late uh, for those of us uh, on the on uh, Pacific time. So we'll uh, make sure that that uh, we we wrap up some a few more questions and then move on to the polling comments. So I'd like to pick back up with this question. Um, John asks, how far south would the second jetty possibly be placed? Okay. Um, again, we, we haven't selected locations yet, so I'm um, interested to hear back from you guys. Um, but the, I guess the furthest south we go would be like Buena Vista Lagoon within the city uh, um, sphere of influence. It'd be like on the north side of uh, Buena Vista Lagoon. Very good. And Paul asks, how will these projects be funded? So really good question. We're looking at a number of things to help fund these, or thoughts to, to fund these projects. Um, of course, we need quite a, quite a bit of money to, to do this, any of these options. So um, looking at FEMA and their BRIC program, Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities, uh, the Department of Boating and Waterways, to name a few. And um, there's also, I don't know, Kyle or anyone like Russ, Jonathan from the city to kind of speak to that. But uh, we also, as part of um, this climate collaborative, were introduced to some new and creative financing programs that other people have, have rolled out to help um, bring projects forward, like uh, Waikiki set up a, a kind of assessment district to help fund local projects. Not to say that's coming to the city of Oceanside, but just, um, just looking at different options a way to fund projects. Hey, Stacy, and if I could add, you know, we might find some funding through SANDAG. Also, um, the city just approved a half cent sales tax last year, and that'll run for seven years. And we've identified a bunch of projects that we're going to uh, use that funding for. Maybe we look at some kind of extension in the future to help pay for some of this stuff. Stacy, I would just add that it's documented in our local coastal program that the federal government bears responsibility for mitigating the impacts of the boat basin uh, on sand supply and ocean side. So in light of that, um, I think there is an argument that there ought to be a federal contribution to the funding of uh, any project that we're able to uh, gain approval for. And uh, Stacy, if I could add something uh, as well. I, I think that uh, the consensus from staff is that Kind of, you know, there's a lot of cities in the state that are uh, facing similar circumstances, as was mentioned earlier. And uh, I think that uh, 
you know, I would, I would, I would think that there would be some grant funding out there to fund something like this. I think that uh, Oceanside is certainly on the cutting edge here in terms of looking at options, and I would imagine there's going to be a high level of interest in whatever we decide to do here locally. So I'm optimistic that we would be able to secure grant funding. Um, I also want to clarify something that uh, Kyle said earlier regarding the half cent sales tax. And I just want to clarify at this point, we have not identified that as a funding source. And if in fact there was a decision to use any of that down the road, then that would be subject to a, a public process for sure and wouldn't be done something uh, outside of that public process. But at this point, we don't uh, intend to use any of that sales tax money for this uh, project. Very good. And I appreciate everybody jumping in on the response for the panel. So um, excellent, uh, excellent question uh, from Paul that's warranted uh, several responses from our panel. Um, at this point, I think I'm gonna pause and start some polling because I'm seeing a lot of questions that are still coming in that are location-based. And I think what we want to do is uh, start to ask some questions for those of you who have hung on this long with us. Again, we appreciate it. Uh, but also um, some questions coming in about some other alternative solutions that maybe Brian didn't mention. Uh, and those are things that I think the city is interested in hearing uh, from the public if there are ideas that um, um, that you have that we haven't thought of or haven't mentioned here today. So uh, if we'll take just a moment to um, open up some polling questions. And Simona, I think you have instructions on how people can find those polling questions. Um, if you're on a mobile device, uh, you might need to do this, select the more options icon at the bottom of your screen. Um, and you may have to tap on the polling icon. Um, if you're on a desktop or a laptop computer, it's likely that these questions are just going to pop up on your screen. So I'm gonna go ahead and open the first um, poll question. And Simona, if you'll pause here at this particular screen and we'll give everybody a chance um, to see it. And I'm gonna check on my end to make sure um, on a mobile device, it may ask you, do you really want to see the, um, the presenter's poll question? So I'm gonna keep this question open um, for about a minute and a half, give you a moment to take a look at it. Um, and question number one, Simona, if you'll advance to the next screen, I see people are already responding. So uh, we've got the advanced group here. Um, question number one says, which of the following best describes how you most frequently enjoy the city of Oceanside Beach areas? And we're gonna ask you to select one of the options. Um, and this is a longer question. So just in case this came through truncated on your mobile device, I'm gonna read that again. Which of the following best describes how you most frequently enjoy the city of Oceanside beach areas? Um, and we're asking you to select one option here. So A, do you enjoy active recreation activities such as swimming, surfing, walking, running, et cetera? B, passive recreation activities, which be considered uh, spending a day at the beach, uh, fishing, or on the playgrounds. C, enjoying the coastal views and overlooks, such as the piers, the stairways, and the sidewalks. Or D, maybe you enjoy the, um, the beach area differently. So maybe you would like to pick D, um, another response. So um, given just a couple seconds there, um, and time has expired, uh, so we'll uh, move on to question number two. And I'm gonna let the, uh, the screen pause here just a second so you can read the slide and then I'll open, uh, open the poll question to you to respond to. So question number two says, I am a, uh, a, are you a coastal resident of the city of Oceanside? B, are you a resident of the city of Oceanside? C, a non-resident of the city of Oceanside, but you value the beaches? Or D, none of these uh, particular options that are presented apply to me. So I'm gonna go ahead and open uh, poll question number two. And I'll let that uh, hold out there for about a minute and a half. Again, asking you to identify as a coastal resident, a resident, a non-resident that values the beaches, um, or possibly none of the above applying to you. So we'll let that hang there for just a moment as responses come in. 
And Stacy, I'll just observe that our coastal zone is relatively constrained relative to other coastal zones um, in the region. So I, I think it's perfectly acceptable for folks who don't necessarily live within the coastal zone boundary, but perhaps are west of Interstate 5 to respond um, with uh, option A to this question. Thank you for that clarification, Russ. And I think the responses are slowing down, so we will uh, we'll keep that open for about 30 more seconds. But Simona, if you'll advance your slide to question number three. Question number three will pop up on your screen in just a moment. This will become available to you. So the sneak preview says out of the sand retention options that are discussed tonight, which would you be most likely to support? And we're gonna ask you to select one uh, this evening. Again, remember there's always going to be opportunity for future dialogue. But would you select after what you've heard this evening, the SR1 or multi-purpose artificial reef is choice A. Choice B, the SR2 groin option. C, the SR3 south jetty extension. D, a different option. Or E, I would like to learn more before selecting an option above. So I'm gonna go ahead and open that poll question. It should pop up on your screen. Um, you'll have a minute and a half to respond. And just in case that uh, that longer question truncated on your mobile device, I'll repeat it out of the sand retention options discussed tonight, which would you be most likely to support? Seeing lots of good responses coming in, so we'll give it just another minute. And the good news is I only see a few of you that may have fallen asleep on us, so we're getting a lot of uh, good participation and we appreciate you hanging in there a little later with us. And if you haven't responded, you have about 30 more seconds. Um, and just to remind you, this, uh, this poll is anonymous. So um, as the questions come in, we're aggregating those responses. Um, and we'll move the slide on, Simona. I'll keep this open for about 20 more seconds, but if you'll advance the slide to question four. In question four, we're asking you to select the one beach nourishment option that you'd be most likely to support. Uh, so please select one of these options. Is it the BN1 or fixed bypass system, the BN2 mobile bypass, or the sand shifter system? BN3, the long-term traditional nourishment program. D, maybe you have a different option in mind that wasn't mentioned uh, this evening, or E, you would like to learn more about uh, the options above before you select one. So I'm going to open the poll for the beach nourishment options. And again, repeating that question out of the three beach nourishment options discussed tonight, which would you be most likely to support? And we'll leave that open for just about a minute longer. And we'll pause for just a moment before we advance to the next question. And the next question I think will be the popular question. Um, and I'll probably ask uh, either Brian and or Kyle to, to hop in here for question number five. Um, question number four, this beach nourishment question will still remain open for 30 seconds um, for you to submit responses. Simona, if you will um, advance to question number five for us, please. Thank you. Um, the location question has come up uh, often tonight, so I want you to have a, a preview of these questions. Um, which location do you think is, or which locations do you think are the most appropriate for the sand retention pilot project? 
Um, so we've listed a couple of areas uh, that maybe the project team is interested in assessing, uh, but maybe you have some thoughts of different locations or you'd like to learn more about how these different solutions um, are applied or which solution is applied in these vicinities. Um, so I'm going to, um, before I open this poll, invite either Brian or Kyle. Um, did you want to uh, to have a a moment to uh, support uh, the future process for determining a location for these solutions? Hey, Stacy, I'll I'll speak and then Brian can follow it up if he likes. I think the thinking the thinking on this is that if you notice all these locations are you know pretty much in the southern part of the city in South O. And that's probably where we need the sand the most. Uh, it seems to get the worst down in these locations. Um, the the locations would actually apply to two of the three sand retention uh, projects that uh, Brian's concept came up with tonight. Um, the the one is the extension of the the south jetty, so that won't really apply. But the reef or the two growings, um, we think you know it's possible that these might be good locations or nearby in the vicinity. Uh, nothing exact, but you know something in these locations would uh, make sense. Yep. Yeah. Nothing to add, Kyle. Thank you, Kyle, for responding to that. I'm going to go ahead and open question um, number five then, and I'll read that question in the um, corresponding responses, especially for those of us who are joining on the phone that may be um, curious about these locations. So as I open this, you'll have about a minute and a half to read through those uh, options and respond. Which location or locations do you think is or are the most appropriate for the sand retention pilot project? Um, and you can select up to three options in our poll this evening um, in the vicinity of Tyson Street, Wisconsin Avenue, Oceanside Boulevard, Buccaneer Beach, Cassidy Street, or maybe you have different locations in mind. You can share that with us in option F or G. You would like to learn more about uh, those locations before you select one above. We'll give everyone just a moment to get those responses in. Remember, we can um, accept up to three of your options if you'd like to pick more than one. And we're just about finished tonight. We do have one more question that we would like to ask you before we um, move back to the Q&A feature and the raise hand feature to take um, more of your questions and your comments. Um, so time is expiring there on question five. Simona, if you'll advance to question six for us. Uh, take a moment to preview question six before I open that poll. Uh, this question has to deal with project impacts, and we know um, based on the, the questions and the um, comments that you've made tonight, you've identified some of the concerns that you have uh, on how this project may impact you or impact the, um, the environment or the activities that uh, you participate in while enjoying the beach. So. What project impacts are you most concerned about? And again, we have multiple answers here um, for you to consider. So we're asking you to select um, up to three options here. Um, are you concerned about surfing related impacts, downdrift erosion, sea level resilience, environmental impacts, costs, public safety, public access, or perhaps you have another concern that is not listed here. So I'm going to open this final poll question. And again, we certainly appreciate your participation this evening. Uh, that certainly helps uh, the project team as well as the city make some uh, informed decisions. Um, and it's your opportunity to have your say. Uh, what project impacts are you most concerned about? Surfing related impacts, downdrift erosion, Sea level resilience, environmental impacts, costs, public safety, 
public access, or possibly you have other concerns. We'll leave that open for just a minute longer. Remember, you can select up to three options. And once you've submitted the responses to that final question, we'll let that poll close out in about 30 seconds, but we will return uh, to our Q&A feature. Um, so as you're finishing up responding to that poll question on your screen, um, Simona, if you will, I'll go back to our ask a question or provide a comment using the Q&A feature. Um, we'll certainly take more of your comments and your questions using that feature this evening. Um, so I want to point out the time, it's about 7.30 and I'll uh, make another call out for the time at the top of the hour at eight o'clock, but we're going to try to get through all of your questions um, this evening. And um, for those of you that may just be making comments, but you don't have questions, we'll be publishing those and the project team will be uh, reviewing those as well. So I would like to um, pick up uh, with the panel, if the panel will um, come back online and be ready to respond to questions. Uh, it got lonely here for just a moment. If you guys want to uh, share your cameras, um, I'm going to uh, to see if um, if Brian, maybe you want to respond to Matt's question. Matt's question um, is asking about some of those uh, alternative solutions that maybe you haven't discussed tonight. Have you considered piping the sand um, the sand vice dredge or truck? Have you considered piping the sand vice dredge or truck? Um, Maybe having I, trouble translating. Um, piping sand. Yeah, I don't. Perhaps he meant. He, perhaps he meant via. Yeah. Uh, via or versus. Yeah, via. Thank you. I appreciate that. Be considered piping the sand via dredge or truck. Um, yeah. So I think um, we're looking at both trucking options and, and dredging options. Well, I, I guess we're. Like, sit, like this sand retention three option, for example, is setting up a, a, a place where the city can access hopefully a large deposit of sand that could be accessed with like traditional construction equipment, um, you know, out there with a, a, um, a loader and some trucks and you could truck the sand down the beach to where you need the most, assuming you have a beach width to truck. Um, so yeah, I think both options are on the table. Thank you, Brian. Uh, some questions that came in prior to the poll, um, citing Oceanside Boulevard and Wisconsin Street, uh, are those the primary considerations for the placement of the two jetties? Do you wanna to respond to that uh, or revisit that again? So the first part of that question was, can you read that again? Sure, Thanks. I apologize. Of course I can. Uh, would Oceanside Boulevard and Wisconsin Street be primary okay. considerations for the two jetties? Um, they're not primary considerations for the two groins, so I, I think those sites make sense uh, amongst others. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. I, I'm interested to see the polling results and and where where you uh, think makes the most sense, but I think those sites do make sense. Thank you. I'll, I'll just mention that the options that we presented in question number five are not exhaustive by any means, and we don't mean to imply uh, that those are the only options available. Hopefully that was understood by um, the other options in there that um, allowed you to indicate that we should be exploring other locations. Thank you, Russ. Um, I'm going to uh, move on to Megan's question here. And uh, Brian, this may be another question, technical question for you regarding models. Um, do you know which models you will be using to evaluate the sand retention devices and or the nourishment options? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, 
I don't know. Can we unmute Aaron? Like Aaron Holloway from GHC is on the line. Um, we're looking at, we're, we're in preliminary conversations to, in selecting a numerical model that makes the most sense. We're looking at the mic suite, whether like a one line model um, would kind of help us understand plan form evolution within like a groin field, for example. So I think at least something that, that speaks to the, the, the one line plan form evolution. Um, Makes sense, but we haven't selected firmly which model to move forward with yet. We're still evaluating the different options. Um, there's a new one that we were just talking about today that um, if Aaron was on the line and have us discuss. But sure, Brian, I can help. I can jump in. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I think like like you said for the feasibility study, we'll be looking at kind of the one line model, which is just a plan view, <clears throat> look at the shoreline, and trying to understand a little bit more about the spacing and length of the groin options or kind of what you would model as a big patch breakwater in these surfing reefs to kind of get, try to get a feel for location and the scale and what the response what the response would be in the short line. I think that's kind of the key goal here. And then in the future phase of the project, when you start drilling down in design, there's some more sophisticated models that could be applied. Perfect. Thanks, Aaron, and thanks, Brian. Um, Aaron, I'm going to go ahead and um, and mute your line again, and uh, we appreciate you hopping in there. And if you would like to lower your hand, uh, that would help me uh, keep an eye on uh, who would like to ask a question. So um, I'm not seeing any other hands raised to ask a question, but I see plenty of questions and comments that have come in on the line. So if you give me just a second to pop back to that screen. Um, we left off with John's question. Um, so John's question is, would BN1 mean that the harbor entrance would not have to be dredged? Brian, do you have a response to this? So it was BN one. Yeah. Oh, yeah. BN one. So that's a good question. the The answer is likely no, and um, the reason why is because we have this this kind of bimodal transport. You have the transport going in two directions. Uh, so you'll still have sand going into the entrance channel from northward transport of sand from you know driven by these. South swell events. Um, so, yeah, there would still be dredging that would need to occur. Thank you. And our next question comes from Rick. And Rick wants to know: Will you look at the Corps of Engineers to pay for sand bypassing since their construction of the harbor and boat basin blocked the transport of sand? It may have contributed or created the the erosion problem. So, um, given that's cost, um, does the city want to respond first? Yeah, I'll go. Um, we definitely feel like a, a big reason we don't have as much sand on our beach as we normally would is because of the jetty that the core built. So, th there's other issues contributing to the loss of sand, but. We feel like that's a big reason, and and they have admitted that uh, there it's pretty much you know one of the main causes of that. So we feel, and I think they agree that they still need to mitigate for that. So you know it's possible we could get some funding for, from them. Very good. And I do see um, another question that's come in from Emily on the Q&A feature. Um, so we'll pick up it uh, with Emily and Simona, if you're keeping track, I may have you help uh, pick up for me after this question. So um, the question from Emily at 6.50 p.m. Uh, and we appreciate that you've waited a while there, Emily. So thanks for your patience until we could get to your question again. Have you considered um, the negative effects on wildlife, um, including the grunions and snowy plover? So I think this was uh, also the question that she asked uh, in her own voice and that you guys responded to if, um, and, and Russ had mentioned that uh, there's an obligation uh, to make sure that uh, all of those considerations are captured. Um, on certain permitting and approvals. Does anyone want to uh, continue to respond to that? I think, I think it's been captured. Okay, 
I agree and we'll move on. Um, so picking up with um, John, Simona, um, I don't know if you can see John's question at 652. Um, do you want to pick up for me there? Yes, Stacey, I see that. I see uh, two questions from John that came in. How big is the intake for BN2 and how far out? How, so BN2 or BN1? BN2, I'm sorry. How how big is the intake for BN2 and also how far out BN2? Okay. You know, I don't have the, thanks for the question, John. I don't have the exact um, diameter handy, uh, but um, I think like ballpark, it, it was like a 10 foot diameter kind of ring or a circle that this thing would create. And um, it, it would be on the intertidal beach, essentially. So it would, um, that's where they place them and all the, the council examples that I shared and, and specifically NUSA. I'll flip back to it if I, if it was easy, but um, basically you, you kind of have it within the intertidal portion of the beach. You, you fix the system in and then you, it kind of spins around and, and digs this big hole in that location and that sand pumps to, to where you need it. And um, so there, since I've been doing this for a while in Australia, there's a lot of data on how quickly that hole fills back up and it fills up remarkably fast, as you might expect. Um, so. Thank you, Brian. Um, okay. Our next question is actually about BN2 as well. This is from Bill. BN2 scaled down mobile solution. Are those pipes then permanently in place or are they visible? So different councils have different systems. Is my understanding the um, the news example has underground pipelines, the 12 inch pipeline that's that's buried underground, but you can just as easily have them um, kind of high lined. Uh, you have them laying on the beach like like the like man like Manson's doing right now in the city of Oceanside. Um, granted, the the Manson pipelines are way um, larger. I think 24 or 28 inch um, diameter, these would be 12 inch diameter. So, you know, half or the size of those pipelines. And yeah, you could either run them along the beach or have them buried. I, I think for the long-term solution, it, it would make sense to bury them. And especially tr to try to get around certain pinch points like um, in front of the pier. Perfect, thank you. Bill also had a second half of his question. Um, with BN3, um, with multiple possible possible sand sources, are pipes always deployed? So with BN3, are pipes always deployed with multiple sand sources? The answer is no. That would be um, there would be like every be like one off ever efforts every time. So it would be you mobilize a contractor, you mobilize, mobilize, do the work, you mobilize. Um, so similar to kind of the Manson or the Harbor Dredge exercise where they're, they, they do the thing, they, they mobilize, and then they, they do the work for 10 days or so, and then they demobilize. So it would be similar to that. Thank you. Our next question comes from Kurt. Do you anticipate large volumes of sand coming to the beach from the uh, Buena Vista Lagoon on an ongoing basis? So that's a good question. Um, we, of course, as part of the restoration project, there's a large number of um, large amount of sand they need to to find a place for, um, and some of that is beach compatible. So I think it's in the the city's best interest to take advantage of that, and I, I think that's already part of the planning process and, and something that's been identified. And then if this lagoon is restored to more uh, of a tidal uh, regime, which I think is the plan, there would be some um, flood shoal deposits similar to San Alejo and San Diego and, you know, kind of San Los Penasquitos, like all those lagoons have to manage sediment within them. So there would probably be something like, you know, 20,000 cubic yards or something a year that would come out of that system, that would be dredged from that system to keep that tidal entrance open. These, I'm just kind of ballparking. Um, um, and, and using those examples down coast to, to kind of derive those numbers. I don't know the exact numbers. I'm not um, working on that project. 
Thank you, Brian. Our next question comes from Carolyn. You mentioned San Luis Rey River as a sand replenishment source. Have you studied the sand flow up the uh, SLR River and the effects of the detention basins in the river and other projects upstream that would slow or stop the sand flow uh, to the beach? Yeah, really good question about the San Luis Rey. Um, haven't studied it in detail. We just know that um, there's existing management actions to try to, to clear sediment from it that the Corps has been working on for some time. Um, some of that might come down to the beach one day. I know the city's been actively coordinating with the Corps on that project. Um, so I don't have a, a really great handle on the sediment yield from the Stanley Ray or all the, the sediment traps, if you will. It'd be something that we'd be kind of looking into and and, and um, the use of that source of sand is like how quickly that that source would replenish. So it's a good question. Noted. Stacy, in, re in response to both Kurt and Carolyn's questions, I would say that we're quite mindful of the three major contributors to beach loss uh, in Oceanside: impediments to downcoast sand sand transfer. So uh, that's the boat basin. Um, impediments to um, inland sand transfer, uh, riverine sand transfer, um, to the questions from Kurt and, and Caroline, and the extent to which the hardening of the back beach um, prevents um, the natural erosion of the bluff, the sand supply that that provides, and um, the extent to which beach retreat cannot occur in Oceanside because of that hardening. So we're mindful of these things. Um, they are they are challenging dynamics to study um, and understand in a precise way, um, but it is something that um, we are considering. We're looking at the literature. Uh, this isn't all within the scope of this project that we're discussing tonight, but in the context of the LCP, we are trying to get better answers to the question of how these three um, components um, work together and um, to what extent each of them is contributing to uh, what we're experiencing on our coastline. Great comments, Russ, thank you. Um, next question comes in from Venus. Regarding the next step slide, one of the proposed plans of action surrounded stakeholder and public engagement. Their question is, how do you plan to engage with the public? Any specific modes of operation? What does that look like? Thank you. And then they uh, want to thank you for answering. I'll take that one. Um, uh, Brian and I have met with uh, several of the resource agencies and we're going to continue meeting with uh, several more. Um, you know, obviously we're having this workshop here tonight. We would have liked to have had it in, in person and uh, been face to face with everyone. But, you know, in these times we're, we're having to do it virtually. Um, we're going to continue in engaging um, some stakeholders in the resource agencies. And then, you know, at some point in the future, we're going to have to start narrowing these concepts down. Um, we look to probably spring of next year bringing a draft report to council to discuss what we think are probably the rec what our recommendations are going forward, and there'll be some public discussion there as far as you know, do we want to adopt those recommendations or is there something another path we want to take? Um, I would also add that, of course, like any other project that we work on here at the city. Um, we are always open to receiving more information and sharing information with the public. So if anyone has specific questions, I think Kyle had his contact information on an earlier slide. Um, if you have questions after this meeting, if you have additional thoughts you wish to share after this meeting, if you'd like to meet with us one on one following this meeting, uh, we're always open to that as well. Um, as as uh, Kyle mentioned, it is a challenging circumstance that we're dealing with right now because we're not able to engage the public as we normally would. Um, but certainly we want to keep the dialogue going through the process um, and make sure that we're capturing full public input. Thank you. Thank you. 
Simona, I'm going to interrupt you for just a moment. This is Stacy, and I just want to do a time check very quickly. Um, I have 748, um, and I am seeing our participant count drop just a little bit, but we still have plenty of people on the line. So we want to, um, again, our, extend our thanks to those of you who've joined us tonight and have hung in there with us through the, the Q&A session. Um, Simona, I'm going to ask if you'll take just a moment to go ahead and um, pull up the slide with the information that Jonathan uh, referred to for Kyle's contact information. Thank you very much. Um, so for those of you that do need to drop off early, you might take note of the information that we have here. Um, again, after tonight's event, you can uh, direct your uh, inquiries or your comments directly to Kyle Coger, um, the Public Works Director, Director at the City of Oceanside. Um, and if you're still hanging on the audio line with us, uh, an email address to reach Kyle is H-K-K-O-G-E-R or H-K-Coger at OceansideCA.org or the phone number you can reach Kyle is 760-435. 5089 and um, Kyle has uh, let us know that, uh, that he will be uh, taking questions and comments uh, and if he can't respond to those he'll be uh, he'll be um, looking for uh, answers and responses uh, to get those uh, back to you. Um, so just a couple of questions that I do want to address at this time. Um, Simona and I apologize for interrupting. Um, some questions have come through about um, whether people can get a copy of this presentation and, and Kyle, I will, I will let you confirm uh, that both the, uh, the PDF of the slide deck and uh, the recording of tonight's event may be made available on the city's website for future viewing. That is correct. Okay, very good. So we'll make sure that um, that those uh, both are available after uh, after tonight's event. It will probably take some time uh, to get them over uh, to you and uh, for the city to get those posted, but the intention is to get those up. And then another question had come in about tonight's attendance. So we'll certainly um, provide that uh, and, uh, and download the official count from the city. Uh, but we did see, um, a, uh, a high attendance count that, that I could see, uh, with about 88, uh, folks at 642 PM, it was likely higher. Uh, and right now we're seeing, um, 53. So we have seen some people, um, drop out, uh, just after they provided responses to the polling questions. So certainly understandable as we, um, continue to run a bit a little bit longer, but Simona, if you want to um, pick up with your next question, um, we'll we'll resume the Q and A. Thank you, Stacy. Uh, our next question comes from uh, Casey regarding the three sand retention options. How long would each option take to implement? Okay, um, <clears throat> I think the question was how long to permit the sand retention options. A really difficult question to answer. Uh, it is, you know, we spoke to kind of the, the change or maybe the door kind of sneaking open on um, the potential for for coastal to approve such such a structure. Though, um, you know, I'll just say like if if everyone's on board, you can get a coastal permit and all all permits in a year. Uh, but if it's a if there's some a bit of contention or a lot of uh, questions that need need answer or further study, then that, that can you know, be two years to, you know, I don't know, it, it can go, you can not get a permit. That's, that's an option too, but um, optimistically, uh, we're doing a lot of coordination with um, the stakeholder groups and specifically the Coastal Commission to try to get ahead of it. And um, I would think we could get a permit within a year. Um, I will also want to say that um, caveat that with the environmental process also takes time, the CEQA process that Russ spoke to. And um, that can take six months to a year uh, as well. So there's there's things to do ahead of us, um, but I, I'm optimistic that we can can move forward relatively quickly. Thank you, Brian. The next question yeah. uh, coming in is from Serena. Um, what numerical modeling will you be doing, and how will you capture the many different parameters? Okay, I think we captured that one. Um, yeah, uh, I don't know, Aaron. Do you want to? I think we missed something on the parameter side of things, but um, 
I don't know, maybe Stacy, can you unmute Aaron to see if he can be still with us? I will give me just a second to find Aaron. Oh, I think yeah. he dropped off. I think he had okay. a drop off. Nope, he's he's uh, he's raising his hand to speak. So Aaron, I'm gonna unmute your line now. Go ahead. Okay, thanks, Stacy. Yeah, regarding the modeling again, yeah, of course there's a lot of you know complications to coastal processes and especially when we're looking at different structures like this. So the the approach we're going to take from the feasibility level is to look at a simplified model, like, a, you know, it used to be called Genesis, now it's Gencade, and there's a few other products um, commonly used for coastal engineering projects like this. And those models have methods for uh, accounting for different parameters, like grain size, wave climate, wave direction, height period, um, you know, the seasonality that you would experience at Oceanside. So, you know, yes, there's this certainly a simplification that goes on with that model, but um, we think it'll be enough to kind of give us some direction on, you know, how these different alternatives may perform. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, our next question comes from Nick. Regarding the groin length, how many feet will be in the beach and in the ocean? Okay, how many feet? Um, it'll depend on location, Nick, and thanks for the question. Um, so this length is based off of where um, basically the, the revetment line or the riprap line along the beach and then we'll go out um, that length of that's kind of unknown, but we're saying four to 600 feet at this moment. And uh, so depending on how much beach that location has at that time, you'll have um, variable amounts of, of occupied sand um, with that structure. Then we hope to retain sand uh, with the structure. So uh, you'll have some beach. So hopefully more than what's there today, you'll have that, um, that's dry beach and impacted by the structure. I should say impacted by the structure, but there'll be some, some occupation. It'll be occupying a footprint that's on the dry beach. There is um, some, some methods to try to, and we need, to, we need to think through public access on the lateral side, making sure people can walk along the beach and across a structure like a groin. So that'd be another thing that we're looking at within the study. Thank you, Brian. Yeah. With that, I'd love to um, ask Stacy, how are we doing on time? Thanks, Simona. Um, I've got 7.56, so just before uh, the eight o'clock hour. And we're still seeing a lot of questions come in, um, Kyle. So if with your permission, we're going to uh, continue to take those questions coming in. Um, Simona, if you can uh, toggle back through the, uh, the how to ask a question, uh, we'll leave those directions up on the slide. Um, it appears most folks are using the Q&A feature. There may be some confusion on how to find the um, raise hand feature. Um, and if we've already spoken to you um, and you need to lower your hand, Aaron, I, I saw you had your hand raised to, to jump in to respond to um, Brian's question. But if you don't have anything else to share with us, you can lower your hand. Uh, just give that, yep, another tap. So um, I'm not seeing anyone with a hand raised, just um, clarifying that, but one way uh, you can do that, especially if you're on a, on a mobile device, and this may vary. Um, based on the Android and the iPhone, you can click on that participant icon that may be in the upper right-hand corner, um, and then the raised hand button may be lower on your mobile device screen. Um, so it's it's maybe not very intuitive if you've lost that or haven't been able to find that. Um, we apologize for, um, for not pointing out that that may be um, at the bottom of the screen after you click on uh, the participant icon. So we have the Q&A feature open. We have the raise hand feature open. Um, and Simona tells me that I'm going to pick back up um, with the questions uh, at the 710 mark. Um, so a question comes in from um, someone by the name of Shant who says um, on the south side, especially uh, maybe in the 1200 block of South Pacific Street, um, and south of there has been decimated. Um, there's been an ex exponential loss of sand, upwards of 20 foot loss of sand leading to um, collapses. Um, 
so there's uh, certainly uh, some concern, it looks like, around uh, potentially um, a safety issue, um, perhaps a loss of tourism issue, and homes that may be in danger. Um, so he's hoping that there's not analysis paralysis with the with the process, um, and he prefers action. So Kyle, you may want to respond to this. I know uh, when we wrap up tonight, you're going to kind of go through your next steps. Um, do you want to talk a little bit um, about uh, revisit how the the city uh, is uh, taking this on as an important uh, problem to solve? Yeah, I mean, I agree with his comment that the South O has been hit pretty hard. Um, we, I really want to finish this study up by spring of next year and then move to the next phase, which is, you know, design and permitting of whatever options we come up with. And then after that, you know, look towards construction. I mean, it, it, we're, we're a long ways out, but I really want to get this going. Um, I think there's a real need. So it's important to the city. We hear it from the citizens all the time, tourists, we, we know we need to get sand on the beach, so thanks. Stacey, I'll just mention that um, we are well aware of the situation that Shant uh, mentions. Um, we were able, due to unique circumstances in this location, we were able to issue a permit exemption to allow repair of the revetment on, on Shant's property, and I believe two other properties to the south to, to help to mitigate this situation to some extent, but with respect to the loss of sand um, experienced on the down coast side um, of that knuckle or existing revetment there at Oceanside Boulevard, I don't know if that's perhaps something Brian can speak to a little bit about how we might, in conjunction with the installation of any growing field, um, supplement uh, that action um, with sand uh, replenishment on these um, down coast sides of these devices. Yeah, I, I'm actually bringing up Google Earth to get to that location, but um, yeah, as you mentioned, Russ, any option that we consider would have this this need to to mitigate downdrift impacts. So there'd be an amount of sand that needs to move past our retention every year and uh, we're throwing out a number like 200,000 cubic yards. Um, so where that material goes exactly is something that is, is something that's up to um, discussion. And um, I, I think you know, we can, depending on the timing of the year and, and where is in most need, I think is what should drive and what makes the most sense in the, in the setting of the coastal processes within the city. I think what should drive that sediment placement on an annual basis. Thank you, Brian, and, and thank you, Russ and, and Kyle for uh, for responding there. I'm going to take just a minute to um, continue to find our question. I know more questions are coming in, and we're, we're reviewing those if you haven't seen your questions published. Um, a few more coming in, so please be patient with us as we review those. Um, so uh, we certainly want to keep focus um, of the reason that we're here tonight, which of course is um, the need for uh, sand retention, beach nourishment uh, solutions. Um, but a comment has come in from Edward and I'll ask the city if they um, care to respond. Um, if they're truly concerned about wildlife, why don't we enforce the no dog log on the beach? Uh, it's become a dog beach, which chases birds away. Does the city want to respond on dog law enforcement? Ed, I, I appreciate that um, question. And I will um, speak with um, code enforcement and our lifeguard staff um, about the extent to which um, enforcement of of this prohibition is is occurring and I will circle back with you. I have your contact information. Very good. The next question comes to us from Paul and Paul uh, wants to know, assuming loss of sand continues at the current rate, uh, Brian, do you have a critical timeline to take action? I know you just discussed um, the uh, the sand uh, loss and uh, do you want to uh, to put a timeline on uh, when we need to take action. 
you know, I, I really don't have a great answer to that question. I'll, I'll look to maybe the city, see if they have a uh, an answer as far as, you know, sand loss, like if there's, you know, I, I don't know, if there's no real trigger to me of when this needs to happen. I think, I think the city has um, kind of made it clear that the time's now to act and that the city is trying to, you know, take action um, on this. And I think that it really shown good faith in that and, and trying to run parallel tracks of the Army Corps program and the feasibility study that's going on there and, and taking this study on on their own. So uh, with that, I'll hand it off um, for any additional comments. Or to this yeah, I, I, uh, I don't know that I have anything to add on that, but um, you know, we've seen, I, I talked to folks that have lived here their whole lives and been around a long time and they've slowly seen the uh, the, the beach widths go, you know, get narrower and narrower. So I, I think it's time to act and, um, but, but I can't, you know, I don't know when the point of no return is. Thank you for those responses. I'm going to move on to Bob's question. Um, Brian, this one is directed for you and has to do with the BN1 fixed bypass system for the beach nourishment uh, solution option. Has there been any consideration of a potential sand bypass suction at the harbor mouth or making it a part of BN1? Um, so we have not um, tried to couple it with a suction or an intake within the harbor um, because we, we view that as already have been done that the project I spoke to in the in the 80s and decommissioned in the 90s. Um, that project had quite a bit of issues, and you know, we, I mentioned three of them, which the, the fluidizers and the kelp and and the funding. Um, you know, it seemed like from, from talking to the core, the funding piece was a pretty significant one, and that just needing to run that program and run that system every year. Um, but systems like the Tweed River one out on the open coast seem to to function better um, as far as just being, I don't, I don't know. I, I need to, to defer to my bypassing person who's in, in Australia, he's a colleague in Australia. But um, we really thought that the, the fixed trestle system would, would function better than um, trying to grab sand within the harbor, which is kind of leveraging that experience from the, the system that has failed. Thanks, Brian. I'm going to move over to the um, the audio line now. I do see one hand raised, um, so I'm going to call on Matt for uh, Matt Caulfield. Um, so, Simona, if you could um, set our speaker timer, and Matt, I apologize if you uh, if you've been waiting a while, but I wanted to remind Matt you have um, two minutes when I unmute your line. And you can state your name and your organization or affiliation and ask your question or share your comment. So, Matt, I've unmuted your line and you can begin. Uh, hi, actually, this is Pat Caulfield. Uh, I think like I'd like to thank um, everyone for this presentation, especially the city for funding the sand study and for choosing one of the best engineering companies around to do the sand study. Uh, looking at the scope of work, it seems rather daunting that anyone's going to come up um, with, with much of anything. So far, we have two groins that'll cost $20 million. That will have a very minimal uh, effect. It seems to me also that the city of Oceanside cannot even afford those two groins. Uh, going forward, we have to understand, well, I'm sure everybody understands that the city of Oceanside, that the ocean is our economy and it is our lifeblood. It is imperative that we retain the sand and replenish the sand not having the funds, we have to seek outside funds. We will seek them from all, all venues, but all of our, most of our effort should be put in seeking, in seeking these funds from the federal government. And that's where our energy should be put. 
there are many options available. And one option would be to have a committee that's a combination of the city and the citizens. Many citizens here are among the best and the brightest. They've dealt with the government for many, many years. They understand the government. They could be part of a pro bono committee. And it could be a very persistent effort uh, going forward. And if we go forward, we should not be thinking in terms of a small, minimal effort. We should be thinking in terms of a much bigger effort. Because when these funding agencies fund, they do not want to risk their funds. They want to put their money on a sure thing. So we should be looking at a state of the art plan. A plan that would be the gold standard, not only for Oceanside, but for all of San Diego, for all of the West Coast. Once again, our best effort would be going to the federal government with a very, very good committee. Uh, so uh, thank you for listening. Pat, thank you for those comments and thank you for identifying yourself. We did let you run over just a little bit because we haven't had that many uh, speakers who have raised their hand to speak tonight. So Pat, I'll ask you to um, move back to that raise hand feature and if you'll tap it again for us to lower your hand. Um, and then I will uh, ask the city if they care to respond to uh, Pat's comments on uh, the need for federal government funds. Uh, I thought you made a lot of really good comments. Uh, and I agree that the, the federal government needs to play a big part, uh, hopefully in whatever we come up with. I, I think the reason that we're not maybe looking at a grand solution at this point is it's important for us to find something that uh, the re resource agencies will buy off on and let us do a pilot. So I think we, I think we need to start small and then prove something will work, that it's not negatively affecting others, and then we can possibly, you know, go from there. I think if we get to the point where we, we get a project that can be permitted, that people are happy with, I think there will be some funding opportunities that we can go after. And like I said, I think we need to start small and, and then grow it from there. But I thought you made some really good comments. Very good. Thank you, uh, Pat, again, for your comments. And uh, we're going to move back to the Q&A feature to take some more questions there. Just a quick time check. I have um, 11 minutes after 8 o'clock. Um, so, Kyle, I, uh, I believe we were willing to uh, to go to about 830. I still see just a handful of questions that we can try to uh, to sum up. So I'll let you know just before uh, 830 hits and you can make some closing remarks um, for the beach nourishment solutions one and two. And, and this is going to be for Brian. And this question comes from John um, again. What are the pipes made of? All right. Um, I assume HDPE, though we haven't uh, haven't dug into the details on those options. And but I, I just know that's kind of the state of the industry is use of HDPE pipes. Very good. Um, and the the question, uh, the follow up question that was, how do you handle corrosion, or how do you protect people and wildlife from the suction? Okay, so I think the first one was to do with corrosion and um, HDPE does a, a kind of takes care of itself with being an alternate kind of material. And then as far as um, wildlife impacts, that would be something that we would need to to kind of work within, um, work around and, and try to do the least environmentally damaging thing we can, um, try to manage sand resources within the city. So. Um, Good, good case studies from Australia to look to and how they've, they've managed that. Um, a lot of sensitive resources there as well. So um, similar, comparable kind of um, case study. Very good. The, uh, the next 
I'm going to wait for that feedback to settle down. There we go. Um, so the next question is likely directed to the city. So Kyle, I'll, um, I'll ask you to take this question from Lauren and Lauren wants to know, will we see the results of the polls that were taken tonight? Yes, we can make that available. Very good. Um, DM has asked another question, um, and this is uh, more of a technical question, so I'll direct it to you, Brian. Has there been any thought given to the highly contaminated water and therefore sand from the San Luis Rey River, um, such as the pesticides, sludge, microplastics, um, and using this sand uh, from the river for replenishment? Yeah, so we'd have to look at all that. Um, there's a, a federal process that the sand would need to be tested against. It's called the, the Inland Testing Manual. And the, the US EPA and the Army Corps essentially um, manage that program. So we, we need to, in the next stage of this study, is to um, kind of dig into the, the chemical and physical. We'd be looking at the physical properties during this phase at a high level, but um, the chemical properties would come during the next phase. I'll say that the, the program or the project that the Corps is working on upstream um, has gone through this process and has found a lot of sand that's compatible for beach placement. So that gives me hope that there is um, the San Luis Rey sand is is free of contaminants or there is um, compatible material that can be used there. And especially in the mouth where that, that material is you know, subject to um, periods of the year that it's subject to tidal action and it's kind of a dynamic environment. And sandy, um, usually sandier materials are, are less likely to be contaminated. But good comment. Very good. I see, I see that Tom has a similar question um, about pesticides and agricultural runoff. Um, and he cited a source that um, shows where pesticides could be used. So, John, hopefully that response also addresses your question or concern. Um, so I think that brings us just about to the bottom of our, our questions today. Simona, I'll let you uh, catch up there on the on the back side to make sure that we've uh, published what we can. But um, I think a follow up question had come in uh, from Sherry about posting uh, or, or sharing rather the results of the poll questions um, this evening. So although the, the city has responded to yes, um, are you anticipating that uh, that the results of these polls will be posted with the other information, such as the slides and the video, or do you feel like those may come out in, in future reports? Yeah, I think we can probably post it all together, so. Okay, very good. We'll make that um, available to the city, of course, along with uh, the recording of tonight's event and a copy of the slide deck uh, so that that can get posted to the city's website. Um, I do think that is uh, just about the end of the q and I'll leave it open uh, just a little bit longer in case there, there's something I missed and if we've uh, missed your particular um, question, uh, you can certainly let us know. Um, I see a few comments that have come in that we've published along the way as well. I'm not seeing anyone with their hand raised, and I'm certainly seeing the participants uh, getting ready to head to bed. I think we have 33 folks left on the line. So uh, for those of you who have hung in there with us, we are, we're grateful for your attendance and your participation, uh, certainly your, your questions. Uh, for clarification and your comments um, are important to uh, to the city and to the project team. Um, so at this time, it's about 8.17. Um, I want to, uh, to go ahead and turn the event over um, to Kyle at this time, and we'll continue to leave the Q&A open. Uh, and that way, any additional questions uh, or comments will be captured and provided to the city um, for any potential follow up needs. So, Kyle, if you would like to make some closing remarks on what is next. Thanks, Stacey. Yeah, I think we kind of talked about it uh, through the presentation, but I did want to follow up with kind of where we're going next. 
So we'll continue to engage stakeholders and resource agencies. We've, we've engaged uh, several groups so far, but uh, Brian and I have a few more, several more to do. Um, after that, we'll, uh, Brian's group will start preparing a multi-criteria decision matrix for each option to run through. Uh, some of those in the, some of the criteria are the downdrift impacts, surfing, uh, nearshore reef, environmental air impacts, aesthetic, sea level rise. So uh, we have a bunch of criteria that we'll kind of be grading these uh, different concepts on. Um, once we, you know, at some point in the future, we'll be narrowing down the concepts to one option from each uh, category, uh, retention and one uh, from nourishment. And Brian's group will be performing further analysis and numerical modeling. Um, as Brian stated earlier, it's not going to be just probably one thing that's chosen. It, it needs to be a couple that can work together. Uh, we're also going to be seeking some grant funds for the next step once we, you know, get through with the feasibility study of, uh, you know, we'll, we'll come up with an option or options. Uh, we'll have to engineer and then uh, construct it at some point, so we're going to keep looking at grant funds. and. Um, at the end of this feasibility study, we're looking to bring a draft report to the City Council sometime in spring of 2021 for more discussion before we issue a final report. Um, and if we go to the next slide. Thank you. So I'm sure plenty of questions might come up after tonight's uh, a workshop, and so if any additional comments or questions come up, I'd ask you to send them to me. Uh, I've got my email address and my phone number, and um, any questions that come in, I'll try and answer. If I can, I'll pass them on to Brian, and um, we'll try and get them, get them back to you in a timely manner. I want to thank everybody for uh, their partic participation tonight. It was uh, a lot of people showed up we're really happy about. And as I said, if any more inquiries come up uh, that you think of tomorrow or the next day, uh, give me a call or send me an email. Thanks again. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, and thanks again to the panel, to um, Brian Leslie of GHD, Jonathan Borrego, uh, Russ Cunningham, and of course, Kyle Coger from the City of Oceanside for responding to questions tonight. We appreciate your time as well. Uh, and for those of you who uh, tuned into tonight's event or, or dialed in to, uh, to listen, again, we thank you for your interest and your participation, which is extremely important to us tonight. And this includes concludes today's event and you may exit uh, the event by clicking leave which is the red icon or the x uh, for the end of tonight's event and i will ask the panel to uh, remain on the line and uh, we will say goodbye thank you